That's pretty good singing, wasn't it? It sounded good. Y'all did a good job. <clears throat> this morning I'm going to talk about spiritual eyes. Spiritual eyes. When we are motivated by faith in Christ Jesus, our faith then motivates us to obey His gospel. We have chosen in our lives to serve God and no longer to live for ourselves. To choose life with the eyes of faith. To choose to live our life for Jesus Christ each day. And so to look at this life with the eyes of faith and choose to live for Him. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 through 3. Now faith is assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. For by it the men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen is not made out of the things which are visible. Our faith originates from our heart. Romans 10 verse 9 and 10 we, and we hear the word of God. We are sanctified or set apart for God when we obey Him and become a Christian. We are sanctified by our faith in Jesus Christ. Acts 26 and verse 18. Jesus tells Paul to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light. From, from dominion of Satan that they might receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified or set apart by faith in me. So sanctified means to set apart for God, set apart for His use. By our faith we overcome the world. 1 John 5 verse 4 and 5 tells us that whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory, he says, that is overcomes the world. Our faith. Our faith who is the one who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now the motivation of our faith and eternal life in heaven, that's our motivation to have that home in heaven. That's why we look with the eyes of faith. That's why we keep the good fight of faith, isn't it, as a Christian? This, our faith in Jesus, our Savior, keeps us going through every day. Because we have some troubles in life, don't we? We're to walk in this life with the eyes of faith. We keep our spiritual eyes on Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7 tells us, but we walk by faith and not by sight. As we live our lives on this earth, you and I, we stand fast in our faith. No matter what we have to face in life, through discouragement, through trials that come along in our life, through tragic events that occur in our life, we keep our spiritual eyes on the Lord, and by doing this, we look to our eternal reward. There are keys in keeping with the eyes of faith. There are keys in keeping the eyes of faith we have strong. There are three keys that I'm going to talk about this morning. There are keys. There are more keys, but I'm going to talk about three. The first one is Bible study to be approved by God. The second one is prayer is our communication with God. And three is consistent attendance to worship service, and we'll explain that. I'm sure there are many who may disagree with this, but if you want to build on your faith, this is a major way that you do it. This is the major things that you do. Three of the major things that you do to build your faith. Bible study on a regular basis is critical. We have to be knowledgeable of God's Word. We can't expect just to hear the preacher. Don't tell them what you'll hear or understand. Bible study 
is critical. Regular Bible study is critical. You know, you'd think that'd be logical, wouldn't you? <laughs> you'd think it'd be logical for us. You'd think that I would figure that out because I'm his child. He expects that. He expects regular Bible study on our part. That means at home. Bible study on a regular basis so that we're knowledgeable of God's Word so we can tell others of why we have the hope within us. This is how God speaks to us, to our hearts and to our minds. It's hard to imagine how to be a faithful child of God and have no idea what God's Word says. It just makes sense, doesn't it? In fact, we're told in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, be diligent, be diligent to present yourself approved of God as a workman, as a workman that does not need to be ashamed but accurately handling the word of truth. So we must be praying Christians, number two. Paul says, to, he, it says for us to pray without ceasing. We must never neglect our prayer life. This is our communication with God. Uh, our Father in heaven hears us, and He answers our prayers. God wants to hear from us, doesn't He? We're His children. He wants to hear from us. As His children, we must be praying Christians. God communicates to us through His Word, and we communicate with Him through Prayer. Now let's talk about the last one. I, I, you know, I got to be careful. I, I want to be positive. I don't want to be negative. Don't let me be negative. Let's talk about the last key that I brought up. And sadly, there are many Christians that just don't believe this. They just don't. But the fact is, to continue building on our faith, we must not neglect the worship services. That is because they are necessary. God says they are necessary, not Otembo. Hebrews chapter 10, we all know well, verse 23 through 25. I want you to look at that again. Look closely at that. Don't take my word for it. Don't hear what I have to say. I want you to hear what God has to say. Hebrews 10, verse 23 through 25. Look at the words being used and how God uses them. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Without wavering. For he who promised is what? Faithful. Faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another, each one of us, to love Good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together. And then he goes on to say, as the habit is of some. I don't want to be that some. I know you don't either. I'm speaking to the choir here. I know that. We don't want to be the some. But he tells us to encourage one another. All the more as you see the day drawing near. Anybody not understand these verses? I think we all do, don't we? Uh, we all do. We, we clearly understand these verses. We know what these words say, and we understand why God is saying them to us. To participate. To participate. It is clear the reasons why God gave us to these verses. To, to meet together, to participate in the Lord's Supper, to hold fast our confession without wavering, to study God's Word, to give of our means and hear His Word proclaimed. We stimulate each other to love and good deeds. It's a time of prayer, prayer, fellowship, teaching His Word. It's how we encourage each other in the faith, to keep the faith. It's how we grow as a Christian. We're to grow. We're not to always have to have milk. We're to get into the meat of things. We are to grow and develop in faith. I know you're tired and sick and tired of hearing my old examples, but do you remember the Wonder Bread commercial? Long time ago, Wonder Bread commercial. Wonder Bread builds bodies strong 12 ways. You know, wasn't it 12 ways? I think it was 12 ways. Well, Brenda, was it 12 ways? 
I think that's right. It, it builds strong bodies 12 ways. Guess what grows and develops our soul? The wonder bread of God's Word. The wonder bread of God's Word. It's a time that we get together. It's a time we pray. It's a time we fellowship together. It's a time of teaching the Word that we can encourage each other in the faith. It's how we grow and develop. It's a command of God to assemble. He didn't suggest it. <laughs> he didn't ask us to. <laughs> he said to assemble. And even then, even back then, 2,000 years ago, it was the habit of some not to do so. <laughs> Isn't that? <laughs> I can't help but notice that. So why are so many stubborn with God? Uh, I don't know. And I'm trying to be positive. Now, don't let me be negative. But why are so many stubborn with God's Word on this? Why do we insist on being part of the sum? I don't understand that. We face in our lives so many distractions, don't we? We all have distractions. But listen, we're to assemble together. You know, but you see, I, I want to encourage you to come to class. I, I want to do that. I'm asking you, if you don't come to class, you need to come to class. That's where we study, really study. You're listening to me now. I mean, you know, you're hearing me preach the Word of God, and, and you do learn by doing that. But if you'll come to class, we study His Word. We ask questions. We offer our feelings on that Scripture. The same is a Wednesday night. I encourage you to do that, to do so if you're not. And we face so many distractions in our life that every one of them seems to affect our faith. Now listen to me. These distractions, sometimes it's things that we enjoy in our life, like fishing, like coconut cream pie. There are some things that we really enjoy in this life. Sports, fishing, hunting, relationships that we have with others. All these things fill our lives. And on the surface, they seem so innocent, don't they? They're so, they're so innocent, and we enjoy them so much. I, I love to fish, and I take Talon to fish, and he loves to fish. But we have to beware. We have to be alert as a Christian. We have to be aware that Satan, now listen to me, Satan can use everything against us, and he can use the things we love to do against us. The very things that seem so innocent that we enjoy. I, I, you've heard me tell you about that. I'm telling you the truth about the guy that sold his soul for a jet ski at the lake. <laughs> the things that seem so innocent that we enjoy. Satan is smart. He's smart. He's no dummy. He knows how to use these things to divert our spiritual eyes of faith. That's what I'm trying to get at. Always to being faithful and assembling together is what God expects of us. And Satan is smart. He knows what he's doing. And he knows how to draw us away. And sometimes he thinks those things that we really enjoy. Really enjoy. And he uses them against us. Out of all the things in our lives that we face, <clears throat> I don't think there's anything that puts more pressure on our faith than illness, death of a loved one, financial hardships, heartache, grief, suffering in our lives due to sickness, I don't know about you, but I love my dad. I loved him. Worshipped him. <laughs> Almost. I loved him. 
And that was probably the largest and the biggest, I don't know how to say it, that put so much pressure on my faith do you understand what I'm saying? You may have experienced the same thing. Put so much pressure on my faith. And it, it, it required of me to look with the spiritual eyes of faith that I hadn't been doing. I had to wake myself up. I had to look at this. Look at the things that happen in our life every day. And how to overcome them is with the spiritual eyes of faith because we see the promises that God has for us if we'll just live faithful to Him. And He keeps those promises. His promises are sure and steadfast, He tells us. So of all the things that we face, the pressure of our faith, on our faith, Illness, death of a loved one, financial hardship, heartache, grief, sickness. The truth is, God's Word is the only source to deal with all these events that occur in our life. And that's what I found out. God's Word is the only true, true source to deal with any of these things that occur in our lives at all. Because we're to keep the spiritual eyes of faith on our goal. It's a home in heaven, isn't it? God has given us many examples about this. <laughs> to maintain the faith, keeping our eyes on the goal. And I want to use one this morning that you studied and I've studied. And that's the life of Job. And I want you to look with me in the book of Job. In the book of Job. And we're going to start first with Job chapter 6. I'm, I, wish that, I wish we could read the whole book, but that's obvious we can't. And so I'm going to pick out some certain things in the book of Job that you may not even have remembered. Job chapter 6, verse 8 and 9. That's where we'll be first. <clears throat> Job had all these trials we've been talking about. Job was rich. Job had a financial empire. His financial empire collapsed in one day. He found himself in physical ruin. He found himself in financial ruin. He experienced the death of all his children on the same day. Job 6 verse 8 and 9. Oh, that my request might come to pass. And that God would grant my longing. Would that God be, were willing to crush me. That He would loose His hand and cut me off. What is He asking for? He wants God to take His life. Take my life, He's saying. Now look at Job 7, verse 15. Job in his life, he felt it couldn't go on. Everything that had happened to him in his life, he lost his everything you can think of that we value in this life. He was rich and he lost his health and he's enduring terrible pain. And his suffering was so great, he begged God to end his life. He just felt like he just couldn't go on. You ever felt like that? Job 7 and verse 15. So that my soul would choose suffocation, death rather than my pains. This man is suffering. He is in tremendous pain and agony plus of the things that have occurred to his life. Job was a faithful man of God and he never lost his faith. Now he feels like that he is completely deserted. Look at chapter 19, verse 7 through 10. 
chapter 19, verse 7 through 10. Job says, Behold, I cry violence, but I get no answer. I shout for help, but there is no justice. He has walled up my way so that I cannot pass. He has put darkness on my paths. He has stripped my honor from me and removed the crown from my head. He breaks me down on every side and I am gone. And He has uprooted my hope like a tree. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? We thought we were the only ones hurting. We thought we were the only ones suffering in pain. We thought we were the only ones that lost everything. We thought we were the only ones that God has completely deserted us. Welcome to Job's world. Look at Job 19. Again, verse 14. Verse 14 through 22. My relatives have failed. <laughs> And my intimate friends have forgotten me. Those who live in my house and my maids consider me a stranger. I am a foreigner in their sight. I call to my servant, but he does not answer. I have to implore him with my mouth. My breath is offensive to my wife. <laughs> He's got it all. And I loathe them. And I am loathsome to my brothers. Even my young children despise me. Or even young children despise me. I rise up and they speak against me. All my associates abhor me. Those I love have turned against me. My bone clings to my skin and my flesh. I have escaped, escaped only by the skin of my teeth. Now you know where that saying comes from. Pity me. Pity me, he says. Why do you persecute me as God does? Are you not satisfied with my flesh? Have you felt deserted in your life? Have you asked why all of this is happening to me? <laughs> Have you tried to make sense of your condition that you're in? Through it all, Job never lost his faith in God. Boy, he was borderline, but he never did. He kept his spiritual eyes of faith. Now listen to me. He repented to God for his attitude that he had. Job 42, verse 2 through 6. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of you is of yours can be thwarted. Who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have declared that which I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, he says, which I did not know. Hear now and I will speak. I will ask you and you will instruct me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. How many people have you known because of something that occurred in their life that they blame God? After Job kept his faith through it all, God restored his health and everything else. In Job 42, verse 16 and 17, it says, After this, Job lived 140 years, and he saw his sons and his grandsons, four generations, and Job died, an old man full of days and full of faith in God. Many times in our lives we, we face all these trials, but we have to keep and maintain the eyes of faith to keep trusting in our Heavenly Father. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 through 10 tells us, Paul does, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, 
struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body of the dying Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. So whatever happens in this life, whatever in our lives that we have to give up, it's worth it to keep our eyes of faith open and have that home in heaven and grow in faithfulness. The Apostle John encourages us today to look to the future. Look to the future with the eyes of faith, he's telling us. We see John's vision from Jesus Christ that he gave him. And we can't read all of these verses, but I want you to look at some of them. Revelation 21. Look at Revelation 21, verses 1 through 7. I wish we could read them all. Revelation 21, 1 through 7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. And he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no longer any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the, th on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And then he said to me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things. And I will be his God. And he will be my son. Look at Revelation 22, verse 1 through 7. Revelation 22, verse 1 through 7. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as a crystal, coming from the throne of God of the Lamb and of the Lamb. In the middle of the street on either side of the river was the tree of life bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse. And the throne of God and the Lamb and of the Lamb will be in it. And His bondservants will serve Him and they will see His face. And His name will be on their foreheads. They will... And there will no longer be any night, for they have no need of light of a lamp or a light of the sun, because the Lord God will illuminate them, and they will reign forever. And he said to me, and to you and I, these words are faithful and true, and the Lord, the God of spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take to place. And verse 7 he says, And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. God is on his throne. <clears throat> and we look at him with the eyes of faith. We see John's vision that he gave, that Jesus gave to John. He has a home for us. He is the God of the universe and beyond. And He has a home for His faithful. If we will just keep our eyes of faith on the eternal home, on the eternal goal, to live for Him in our life each day. There are, there, I'll say this, there are billions of people on this earth that are busy with their own desires and they're far away from God and they deny Him. They, they have their own priorities and is not God, which does not include God in their lives ever. And they are many enemies to Almighty God. They are busy 
listen to me, they're busy taking the broad way. That's what they're doing. Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14, Enter through the narrow gate, Jesus says. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and many are there, and many there, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small, the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. This is Jesus' words. Few who find it. A Christian looks with the eyes of faith. We look by faith heavenward to our war, toward our future home. A Christian is looking with the eyes of faith. We want that home in heaven. James chapter 1 and verse 12 says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he was received. The crown which the Lord has, the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Romans chapter 8, verse 16 through 18. The Spirit himself testifies with what? Our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him so that we may, so that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is going to be revealed to us. Listen, it's worth every price we have to pay to live as a Christian, to be faithful in this life, to look with the eyes of faith, to keep our faith and keep our eyes on the goal. Through it all, through it all Job, Job never lost his faith in God. Job was faithful. We can be faithful. We can keep the eyes of faith and be faithful to Him and walk according to His will. We can do this with the eyes of faith. You may be sick of hearing me right now, but I want you to listen. If you have not obeyed the gospel, just like he says. Just like our Lord Jesus Christ says. Not me. Or not anybody else. Not some other fella. Obey his gospel. Like he says. You know that's only right. Isn't it? He died for us. He hung on that cross. And he died in our place. It is his church that we enter automatically. When we obey his gospel. It's only right that we obey Him like He says. Not like my cousin says or my mother says or my daddy says. They're, they're not going to get me there. The Lord gets me there. And when I obey Him just like He says, I don't have to worry about it, do I? If we'll just believe in Him that He is the Christ, the Son of the living God, if we will repent of our sins, if we will humble ourselves, and if we will confess our sins, He will forgive us. And if we will confess it, He is the Christ, the Son of the living God, in public, in front of others. And then if we're baptized for the remission of our sins, we go down in that watery grave and come up a new person in Christ. We are not sprinkled. We're not joining the church of our choice. We're, we automatically come out of that grave and He adds us to His church. The most of the problems we face in this country today is people who think they are Christians because they go to a church building. It is not a church building. You are a Christian because you have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, the only gospel, and by your obedience you were automatically added to His church. This is a building. This is where we meet together. To study His Word and to worship Him. I'm not being negative, am I? I don't want to be negative. Please, Darwin warned me. I can't be negative. <laughs> if we'll just do that, we beg you to do that, then all of the promises of a home in heaven, they're yours. 
if you live a faithful life to Him. In a minute we're going to sing a song encouraging you to come. If you're a Christian, is your faith strong? Do you look with the eyes of faith daily in your life? If you're not, you need to make it right. Are you an example in life that you should be? If you're not, you need to make it right. Can others see Jesus Christ in your life every day? If they can't, you need to make it right. Listen. I, I, I don't want to be negative. I'm not going to be. Everything I said was positive in a positive manner. Wasn't it, Beverly? I love you. I want to spend eternity with you. Every one of you. You want to spend it with me? <laughs> help me too. <laughs> we can help in any way this morning. Won't you come while we stand and sing?